This is the Prehistory Guys podcast. I'm Rupert Soskin. And I'm Michael Bott. Welcome to the Prehistory Guys podcast number 25. You know, I'm not sure how to kick this one off because we've wanted to interview this giant of archaeology <laughs> for ages, but he's just so eternally busy that gaps in the diaries are frankly as rare as Denisovan teeth. <laughs> Denisovan teeth, so true. This month's special guest is none other than the man you keep hearing us call Mr. Ubiquitous. Professor Timothy Darwin, OBE. <laughs> Indeed. It, it, it really is a treat to get Tim on the show. I mean, his CV is way too long to wade through here. But I mean, we could offer a nutshell approach, couldn't we? Or we could even offer the anecdotal approach. I mean, there's no end of lists that yes. we could rattle off, but uh, that would take uh, up most of the podcast, I think. It is true. I, I think we should certainly not um, uh, not leave out the fact that there are not that many archaeologists who can claim OBE. No, no. Uh, it just does show th just how hugely he is held in esteem. In a, well, a, a couple, I mean, one major thing, and, and, and this will come up in, in the interview, um, that um, Tim and his colleague um, uh, Jeff Wainwright the mm. late Jeff Wayne, Wainwright, the only archaeologists in this century to have been granted permission to pierce the turf at Stonehenge and actually dig within the circle. That is quite something, isn't it? Yeah, that, that gives, starts to give you an indication. But we've got sort of anecdotal things. There is a, there is a, a Neolithic <laughs> settlement, but four miles from where I'm sitting now, in, uh, in, near Stratford-upon-Avon, and uh, it so happens there used to be uh, a henge there. If you Google Barford Henge, one of the names that comes up, Tim Darville. If you Google an awful lot of things, what the first name that comes up is Tim Darville. Um, even to the extent that I was looking into some stuff in the south of France. You know, oh, enclosures in the south of France. Let's have a look at this. Oh, Professor Tim Darwin, you think, well, where haven't you been, man? Indeed. <laughs> if you go to Crickley Hill in Gloucestershire, as Rupert and I did, we look out across the valley, half a mile away to the next peak along, which is called uh, Peak Camp, strangely <laughs> enough. Guess who dug there? Tim Darvill. Mull Hill on the Isle of Man. Yeah. Tim Darvill. It's, it's everywhere you look. Darvill was here. Darvill. <laughs> Uh, yes, it is quite extraordinary, quite <laughs> extraordinary. And he's worked, I mean, he's directed projects in Germany, Russia, Greece, Malta, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. just all over the place. It's so um, we don't call him Mr. Ubiquitous for nothing. No, we don't. I think without further ado, we ought to um, yes, get him in, shall we, and think, say hello? I think we should. Yeah, let's do that. So welcome, Professor Tim Thank you. Darville to the Prehistory Guys Yes, Podcast. about damn time too. Well, it's <laughs> been, been looking a... forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, the first things first, I think the question we want to ask is, um, kicking things off, where did it all begin for you? Where did it all begin? Yeah. My word. I'm very lucky in a way, because I think the archaeology bug bit me at a very young age. And I was very lucky because we were living in the Cotswolds at the time. And of course, that's one of the richest areas for archaeology in northwest Europe, really. Mm, absolutely. And I was always rather keen on digging holes and finding things <laughs> in the garden. And, and I don't think it happens so much today, but I was one of those children who was allowed to play outside most of the time. And so being in the garden, being out and about was, was kind of part of early life. And I suppose that led into you know, the inevitable, what is this? Where did it come from? How old is it? What's it like? How's a fossil a fossil? And how's this a piece of pottery? And these, these kind of questions which you know, children start to ask. And I remember one of my first memories is actually my father, who was a civil engineer and interested in, in gravel and rocks and all this kind of side of things, um, giving me a book. And it was Graham Clark's book called Prehistoric England. Well, age four or so, I don't think I dealt with the text very well, but there were pictures. <laughs> and that was really important and really interesting. And amongst the pictures was a picture of Beeler's Nap, which was a long barrow not too far yes. away from where we lived. Mm. And pretty quickly, you know, 
as an ad one makes associations between the pictures and something interesting and the fact that it was in a book so therefore it must be really important and hugely interesting meant that we went up there and um, did blackberrying and visited the site and it just drew me into thinking about the landscape thinking about the holistic nature of the landscape the plants the animals the rocks the fossils the people all the things that go with archaeology these days Um, and it drew me in in rather well and I was very lucky because back in the 19, late 60s and 70s, there was a lot of archaeology going on. Yes. And you could join in. I mean, even as a schoolboy, you could join in to excavations and surveys and so on. And, um, and I did. And um, went on to excavate at Roman sites and prehistoric sites. And when I got to um, sixth form college, we didn't have lectures every day. So I used to skip out and do excavations with oh, the wow. local archaeological unit, which oh. was run by Alan Savile, <laughs> working on barrows up in the Cotswolds. And um, two days a week, very often, I'd be actually out in the field digging. And the other two days, up at college, so <laughs> doing my A-levels. Yeah. <laughs> so was there, a, was there a moment when you realised that you were going to be an archaeologist? Or is, is, was it a kind of assumption from the age of four kind of <laughs> I think it was a kind of assumption yeah. right from an early age that didn't seem to be well there's lots of other interesting things and yeah. to my mind that's one of the great beauties of archaeology there's almost no subject which archaeology doesn't actually touch on yes um, particularly subjects relating to the world the environment the natural world as well as the human world um, we're interested in everything really and everything has got a part to play in making archaeology a more interesting discipline yes because if human beings are doing it then we're interested. Yeah. And they're yes. doing everything. So we're interested in everything by definition. Mm. Yes. Fascinating. So from those beginnings in Gloucestershire, then, did, did your work then kick off in Gloucestershire or did you disappear around the place to then come back home subsequently? Because a lot of your work has been in. Uh, I've always, the yeah, always maintained a, a foot in Gloucestershire. Um, I did a lot of excavation and survey work early on there and um, even before I went to university I was supervising excavations at Sirencester and again you know one can talk about the good old days but in those good old days every summer most of the major cities and towns had massive scale (coughs) excavations going on in them you know Gloucester, York, Lincoln, Sirencester was no exception, Winchester was in there and as a student as a schoolboy at first, you could go on these excavations for six weeks or so. You were paid a pound a day to be on the excavation. Good and, grief. You know, those summers were just <laughs> extraordinary. You know, a pound a day in the 70s brought you quite sufficient beer and <laughs> enough to live on. Um, we were camping or camping out in old houses and things. Um, and you spent six weeks through the summer vacation. And the excavations in Sirencester, typically 100, 150 people working on it wow. um, I was quite quickly a supervisor looking after one of the one of the trenches four or five trenches in the excavation um, and so the summer was just a delight and I suppose that perhaps more than anything for two or three years made me think this is actually the life to be yes. um, and of course as you get into into archaeology you find that you're out in the summer so from you know, broadly speaking May through to the end of September you're out in the field yes and then of course from September through to you know, at the beginning of the next field season the next year, you're indoors in the warm, writing up, <laughs> sorting out your pottery, looking at yeah. the flints and doing all the other things. So in a way, what's not to like about it? You're outside at the perfect time of the year and you're inside when it's yeah. best to be inside. Yeah. What was your first find of whatever type? What was the first find that actually made you stop in your tracks of, you know, Good God, what's, you know, what have I found here? <laughs> I suppose my, my first find that I first remember um, is, is, is the sort of find that most, most archaeologists end up finding early in their career, and that is, of course, a human burial. Um, it was a Roman site near Andoversford. I was still at school. We used to dig on the weekends and uh, would cycle out there as five or six miles from home um, and work away. It was a burial ground in the top of a, basically the edge of a Roman settlement. And um, the first time you scrape over the top of a grave and see those bones sticking out is the first connection you have with the real people of the past. I mean, yes. we'd found pottery and flint and all these kind of things before, of course, but suddenly you're confronted with a real person who was there mm. in exactly that period that you're trying to explore. And I think for a lot of people, and I've, I've heard this from others too, it's that first human set of human remains that you find which just ties you yes. to the discipline and draws you into it in a way that is quite impossible yeah. in, in any other sphere. Interesting. I wasn't expecting that answer, but yeah, it makes complete no, sense. I re- yeah. really get that. Yeah, yeah. I suppose yeah. one might think of, you know, what's the, what's the 
best find in terms of a most valuable or most intriguing or something of that sort. But I do some work, I've done work on the Roman and medieval periods and so on. That's all very interesting, but it's prehistory, which really mm. um, fires me up. And of course, as you go back into prehistory, particularly the Neolithic and so on, there's spectacular finds, but they're not perhaps spectacular on most people's scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, a stone axe or a beautiful piece of worked flint and so on is something pretty special. Yes. But, um, you know, to somebody walking down the street, that may not look like the best find in the world. <laughs> Absolutely. I, it's certainly true for us, isn't it? That we were generally we're most intoxicated by pl- places where people lived rather than died. Yeah. Mm. Uh, which is why Orkney has been so special uh, for us. You know, you can go to places where people lived, stand where they stood, that sort of thing. But uh, but yeah, no, that's interesting. Bones yeah. is a, is a fascinating thing. Yeah, we've always got to remember though that um, yeah, the settlements are important, the burial places are important too. But we present them as burial places, and yet the one group of people who never did any anything there are the dead people. Mm-hmm. Burial places are all about the living. Okay. And so they're arenas for celebrations, for commemorations, for all sorts of activities that go on with it. Mm. And I think, in a way, we, we focus on the dead because that's what we find. But actually, it's a signal to us that we've got to focus on the living because that's who were there. Mm. And that's the yeah. people who did it. Those are the people who made the barrows, who created the ceremonies, who actually celebrated all the things that were going on around the burial event. Yes. Beautiful. So here's the, here's the thing. You're most closely associated, of course, in most people's minds with Stonehenge. But by um, accident of, of where you were born and, and grew up, your association also for you is very strongly with the things you've just been talking about, and that is the, the long barrows of, of Gloucestershire and, uh, and roundabout. So um, you talked about... Um, Going up to Bayless Nap, hmm. um, which is one of our favourites. It's one of our favourites, yes. From, uh, <laughs> several, several points of view. Um, but that obviously drew you into other sites of the same, of, of the same type. Mm, it did. And um, I suppose I didn't realise just how rich the area was when mm. I started. Um, being drawn in through perhaps through Beeler's Nap, then going to see all the other famous sites, Hattie Pagler's Tump and the Nimsfield yeah. Barrow and Windmill Hill, Windmill Barrow and so on. These these are all places to go and visit. And they're all very visible in some of them. You can even go inside and take mm. a candle and it's really oh, quite yeah. uh, atmospheric yeah. and, and uh, very emotional. But I suppose like many people, I thought, here's a plan. Let's go and visit all the barrows in Gloucestershire. So, That's you know, <laughs> you, you get the list, you put some uh, some uh, fuel in your motorbike and get your pedal cycle out and you start going around. And it takes quite a while, but it's easy. There's a hundred long barrows in Gloucestershire. Well, there was at the time. There's one or two more now, but um, there's about a hundred barrows in Gloucestershire. And so it takes a few weeks to um, to get out there and see them. And mm. most of them are visible. There's a few which have disappeared for one reason or another. Yeah. Most of them are visible. And then you look around and realise a hundred long barrows in a well, half of Gloucestershire, because it's only the Cotswold side of it that's, that's got barrows, and you think the density, that's absolutely extraordinary. That's yes. greater than Wiltshire or Dorset or you know, many of these other places. And then you realise, actually, I've seen all these, right, so now what do we do next? You know, How do we, how do we figure this out? Mm. So, of course, one starts reading all the reports and the excavation reports and starts formulating ideas of one's own about how these things work. And to bring us sort of up to date on this bit, um, there came a point where I, where I was thinking about long barrows and thinking well we we need to have another opportunity to excavate one we need especially one that's got several phases to it I was involved in the Hazelton excavation but the Hazelton long barrow was all built in one phase they just basically went to a, a virgin field and parked a long barrow there Interesting. it's beautifully okay. integrated it's absolutely symmetrical really really nice piece of, of barrow building by the Neolithic people but um, we needed one which had several phases to it that we could really unpick the development and evolution of the site. And there's a couple around, Knockgrove is one, for example, but of course they're all protected, they're all scheduled. Um, access is, is therefore quite difficult and it's controlled by the legislation and all the rest of it. And I really wanted to try something a little bit different. And rather than having a really fixed, prescribed, so-called research design where all the questions are set out and you almost have to answer the questions before you even start digging, and this has always <laughs> seemed to me the wrong way around. Um, I wanted to do something much more kind of inductive, much more sort of sympathetic to the evidence. I wanted to listen to the site. Mm-hmm. And perhaps one of the things I learned quite early on as an excavator is that you've got to listen to the evidence. 
You've got to see what the sight is telling you and feel the sight and, and literally open your ears to what's going on. And that's what I wanted to do with long barrows. So the obvious thing was, was to find one that nobody knew about, mm. that perhaps even was a new discovery. Yes. Um, and that's happened, although it happened more or less by chance that um, a farmer um, came across one on, on his land and, um, and phoned me up and said, you know, People have said this could be a lawn barrow. Maybe come up and have a look if you like. And so, of course, I did. And I walked across the field with him and, and said, "This is probably one of the best lawn barrows I've seen in a very long time, actually." <laughs> and nobody knows about it. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, because his own sympathies are you know, very similar to mine, he's very interested in the land and the environment and the sustainability of the landscape and the deep heritage that goes with it. Um, all those things came together, and, and he's, he's allowed us very kindly to um, open up that long barrow and start exploring it. And as it turns out, it looks to be a multi-phase long barrow with several periods of activity there. And whilst we're only probably halfway through the excavation as it stands, it's got a huge amount of promise. And, and already we're finding lots of things which people are just not even considered in relation to long barrows. Um, one of which I just just unfold is that Peter's nap is reconstructed with a really smooth top, a really smooth profile to it. Yeah. It's beautifully sculpted and it, it looks very fine. But did long barrows look like that in the past? Mm -hmm. To understand that, the bit you've actually got to explore is not the long barrow, but it's all the collapsed debris that's spread out around about. In other words, how the long barrow fell apart. Yes. And we've in fact spent nearly three seasons now examining what everybody else just shoveled away, which is the collapse around the outside. Yeah. And what we've discovered is that there is as well, a structure to that collapse. It's not all the same. There's some areas which are much more, much thicker and much denser in collapse and some which are really rather thin and, and disappeared. And so when you start to put that collapse back onto the barrow, yeah. you realise it wasn't a smooth profile like Peeler's Nap. It was actually a lumpy, humpy kind of profile right. whereby bits of the barrow were taller and, and perhaps more <laughs> substantial than others. And some bits may have been little more than just, just a platform with great sort of mounds within it. So even our basic, if you like, understanding of what a barrow looked like as you walk towards it has already changed. Yeah. And, and we're only just beginning. <laughs> if you can hear me chuckling in the background, it's because I know what we're talking about here. <laughs> Mike's done some yeah. troweling on that collapse, and he knows exactly <laughs> um, yeah. the pain and the care we've taken to, yeah. to it, examine it, is, it. But It is amazing. Uh, it's quite addictive, though. It really. is addictive, because once you start looking at how stone falls and how mm. it works, gradually you get your mind into it, and gradually you get your eyes to see what's going on, and you can understand mm. the the natural process, maybe people mm. and animals are involved a little bit, but it's basically a natural process of decay. Yeah. And as I say, I'm afraid to say most barriers in the past have shoveled most of that away. Yes. And have therefore lost that value, very valuable information. So that's wonderful that that excavation is ongoing. Um, could you speak uh, a little to your thoughts about how long you know, talk about that we talk about them being places of the dead but of course for them there were places of the living to go and and um, do what they do so what is your take on on that the use of a long barrow the, the way that long barrows are used well that's one of the themes that we're we're exploring through our excavation but what's what's very clear is that we can't even imagine the weird things that happened at long barrows mm -hmm. the weirdness of neolithic ways of being the strangeness of the way that they do things and they seem quite happy to move people about um, partially decayed bodies body parts absolutely clean bones all these things are are being moved about and it may be that they're in fact going off and stealing bits of other people from other long barrows and bringing them back and putting yeah. them in their own i think we've got to completely <laughs> revolutionize our thinking about how this goes we've, we've tended to make the past quite a quite a simple place people of course like to make it a primitive place as well i don't ever think it's primitive it's no. incredibly mm. sophisticated in its own terms in its own way um but the past is a very complicated place and the neolithic is so far beyond our comprehension of what's normal what's practical what's doable how the world actually works that we've just got to step outside everything that we think Mm. And the nice thing, we can be fairly certain that everything we think about the present world, the Neolithic people thought differently. Yeah. Yes. So we can just put all of our baggage to one side and start again. 
Mm. And starting again means going back, as I've said just now, going back to listening to the sights. There's a famous uh, quote from David Clark, who was um, a theoretical archaeologist back in the 1960s. He wrote a book called Analytical Archaeology in 1968, which nobody could um, really understand at the time, but we now come to see what he was talking about. He studied beaker pottery. That was his favourite thing. Right. And at one conference, he famously said that beaker pottery didn't speak, but if you were very quiet and you listened carefully, it whispered. <laughs> and I think that's yeah, how yeah, a lot yeah, of sites totally. are. They don't talk to you, but if you give them space, mm. give them a little bit of time, they will whisper to you. Yeah. And the skill of the archaeologist, I think, is, is to hear what's going on. Mm. And it's being quiet, i.e. putting to one side your, our own, yeah, 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 what's going on now for us. And uh, yeah. It's certainly true that, uh, in fact, one of the things that we, we only came to realise recently at a, at a conference was the ways that the dead were moved around, as you say. Yeah. Uh, well. <laughs> Do you know what? Archaeothanatology. Archaeothanatology, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indeed, we didn't, we, we didn't know what that was. <laughs> but, um, I'm not sure I do now, actually. But um, Archaeologists um, are good at making up new words. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the idea. things that was fascinating, we were actually unaware of quite how many cave burials there are um, in Britain. And uh, the one that I found particularly interesting was a site where all the bones that they've excavated are like phalanges and things. They're little bits that would just drop off a body. Mm. So it's like they've gathered up these nefarious bits and uh, and there was a special place for them to be. I find that quite intoxicating, actually. It's, it is, uh, and, and in fact, strange you should mention that, because one of the things that we've spotted now at some of the Cotswold Barrows is that hands and feet are treated differently. And oh. curiously, this is also the case in in some of the late Mesolithic shell middens oh. around the coast of Scotland. And at uh, the Sisters Barrow, where we're excavating, it looks like some of the hands were put underneath the floor. In other words, they deposited the hands and feet, and then they put a flooring down, and then the rest of the body is on top of that floor. So they're kind of segregated off, even within the chamber. And we found now several other cases in other barrows where excavators have found something very similar. So what is going on? What Why the hell? are these peripheral wow. um, bits of the body so so interesting and treated seemingly in a slightly different way? The next question, which I can sort of see on your lips, is of course, do those hands <laughs> and feet go with the people in the next chamber? Well, in the old days, one would assume that was the case, but I don't think we can assume it's the no. case. And um, we're <laughs> going to have to do some work on the DNA to see if we can actually map some of the peripheral body parts to the core body parts that we've got. Um, and this, I think, is, you know, DNA opens up some fantastic avenues of, of investigation. Yes. And it's going to be the future. And we're going to have to, mm. in a sense, have field laboratories out there and actually doing it in real time as the stuff is coming out so that we can see what the relationships are. And I think we're going to be surprised. I think we're going to find that a lot of the assumptions that we made about the nature of those burials are wrong. Yes. And that there's a lot of mixed people in there. They don't all come from the same family and so on. That's sometimes nice. they do, That's but really sometimes they don't. Okay, so, yeah. you know, we've got so many <clears throat> questions. This is why we need to go back and do new excavations. Excellent. And this applies to every site mm. um, because... For 25 years, archaeology has been in a bit of a rut. And that rut is, let's preserve everything. Let's mm -hmm. not excavate unless it's absolutely necessary. Well, we want to know about the past. People out there want to know about the past. And of yes. course, they expect archaeologists to tell them a bit <laughs> about the past. So to do that, we actually have to excavate sites. We've got to keep moving. We've got to apply all the new technologies. I mean, DNA, we just mentioned, is a great case. You can do a certain amount with the bones that are in museums and so on, but of course we don't always know what's happened to them. Mm. We don't know how they've been treated. We can't even be absolutely certain in some cases that they do come from where they say they come from. Yeah. So getting new stuff and actually having the scientists, if you like, working on the DNA on the site, looking at the samples as they come out of the ground, is as close as we can get to the surety we need yes. that that sample is exactly from that spot and we can process it and, yeah. and look through it. There's no chance of cock-up <laughs> in that yes. sort of system. So we've just got to keep asking questions and we've got to go back and excavate and we've got to do it in new and interesting ways. Excellent. Now, I was 
born on the Isle of Man. Rupert knows the Isle of Man very well, yeah. so it's a, it's a place very close to our hearts. How did you come to be excavating on the Isle of Man? As well, the Isle of, yeah, the Isle of Man's become a place very close to my heart as well, and um, it is an archaeological wonderland, and actually one that not many people know much about. Mm. Um, as you both know from being there, you can um, find archaeology in pretty much every single field on the Isle of Man. In fact, mm. I've never found a field that doesn't have yes. archaeology of some sort well, in it, and the Neolithic is actually quite rich there too. But it is a slightly strange story how we, how we came to be there. Um, we still send all of our students out on placements. They go and work with industry, with a museum, with a government agency or something like this. It's a really important part of our course and a really important part of training for students. You've got to have real world experience. Back in those days, we're talking now the 1990s, um, we used to go and visit each student on placement. And we used to divvy up amongst the staff in the department where we would go. And the department used to pay even better. Um, so we had this opportunity, which I'm afraid uh, costs prohibit us doing nowadays, but we used to have this opportunity to go and visit the student and just spend a day or two in the place where they were working and find out what was going on. So it happened that a student was on placement to Manx National Heritage. And I drew the straw, which was actually a rather good one, as it turned out, <laughs> to, uh, to go and visit. And uh, I'd never been, that's not quite true, I had been to the Isle of Man once before, just to visit and see a few, um, few sites. I drew the straw, went up there, and um, at the time they were working on their redisplay of some of their collections, and they were very interested in their Neolithic pottery and so on, which was um, perfect for me to talk about and help them with a bit. And at the same time, there was an expansion of a big limestone quarry in the south of the island. And a few weeks before I got there, there'd been some pits discovered with some Neolithic pottery in. And um, so we went out and had a look at it. And it became pretty obvious that what was needed was some more excavation adjacent to um, the existing quarry, which was where they were going to expand into over the next decade or so. And um, so we went and did some geophysics and the usual, usual pattern of things. And of course, it was absolutely thick with archaeology and several things stood out on the plot as, as potentially Neolithic. And so we, we um, agreed with Manx National Heritage that we would do a program of excavation, um, which they partly supported and we partly supported. We used it as a training excavation. Right. So it was a very happy 10 years of, um, ten years. of excavating at the Balaam Quarry. And we found everything from later Mesolithic um, pits and areas of, of occupation right the way through Neolithic enclosures, Neolithic pit clusters, through into Bronze Age field systems, a very nice little Bronze Age settlement with four houses in it. And then there was an Iron Age settlement with three houses in it. And then there was some what we would call sort of early Christian period um, occupation there as well. So it had pretty much everything going for it. And mm. within the within the area we excavated, which was several hectares, um, we got a complete sequence right through. Um, as with so much big scale excavation, we're still processing <laughs> material. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one yeah. of the daunting things about the kind of excavation I've just been talking about is the sheer volume of stuff that you get to process. Yes. Um, and one of the things which I particularly keen on and which does slow us down a bit I'm afraid but it's it's hugely important so many excavations throw away the best evidence and the best evidence is the soil it's yeah, the yeah, matrix yeah, yeah, in yeah. which all this stuff exists sampling that and understanding the matrix allows you to understand where the stuff came from now everybody studies the pottery and the flint and all the other bits and pieces that you get and forget about the matrix and yet that's the most important bit and so processing that soil through and sorting it all out does take a long time, but yeah. it completely enhances and in many cases alters the interpretation of the artifactual material. Yeah. And I personally don't believe you can even start to think about the artifacts until you've understood the context and the matrix. Mm -hmm. So, to say a little bit then about how you, how you would analyse the matrix, then because obviously yeah. the the preconceived idea is that, as you say, you would be looking at the pieces of flint or what have you. Yeah. So, how do you actually approach that? We've we've evolved. We've been developing the approaches to this over a number of years, and we've evolved a strategy which seems to work now. It's taken a little while to get it right, but broadly speaking, we sample every single matrix, every single context, with a small volume of soil, which we process. In great detail, we wash it through, we sieve it out, we quantify the different grades of minerals and sand and silt and so on, which are in there. We create a full 
analysis of the background matrix. We then sieve that through and extract any charcoal and any micro remains, plant remains, insect remains, anything of that sort, so that from our initial five litres we've got a complete spectral breakdown of all the microscopic stuff that's in that layer. And of course at that point we suddenly realise that the objects have come in with some of that microscopic stuff. And so it's part of that process. If there's particular aspects of that sample that we then want to look at, for example if it's very rich in charcoal, we might then go back and resample that context to get the charcoal out. So we've got a really substantial section of that. If we found there was a lot of microflint debitage in there, for example, we'd go back and resample that context to get the microflint debitage out. So everything gets processed to a high level but in small volume. Right. And once we spot what's interesting about it, we would go back and take more Fascinating. Um, in mm. bigger volumes. Mm. The trick in, in many cases, is, in other places, is often to take big volumes and then to analyse tiny amounts of it, which is a very wasteful yes. system. We do a lot with a little, and then we build up according to what's worth spending a bit more time Fascinating. On. So it's, was, it's the other way around. Yeah, what was the name of the quarry that uh, you particularly that you spent Balan. so much time? Yeah, Balan is the quarry we were working on. It's in the south part of the island, just to the north of, of Castletown. Nice. Um, it's a beautiful limestone area, uh, and it is a very large quarry, of course, and provides a lot of stone for the island. What about the other sites on the island? Have you had opportunity to...? Yeah, we've had a look at a few. We've done a lot of survey work, um, a lot of geophysical survey, um, partly because it was a training excavation, so one of the things that students had to learn was, was the opportunity to get out and do some geophysics. So over 10 years with quite a lot of students, you do quite a lot of fields. Um, so we did, I think, about four square kilometres of right. geophysical yeah. survey. Wow. around Balan. And then we went and, and picked off, if you like, all the known monuments, all the long barrows of the same sort of period, and we did detailed surveys of those as well. We didn't excavate any of the other long barrows, and we just did surveys on those. We did a bit of work at Ronald's Way Airport when they were expanding that and, <laughs> and did some test pits and so on there. I think there's subsequently been some bigger scale excavations there. Um, and we did one or two other small trenches here and there, but it was mostly survey work out of Balan. Mail Hill is um, one of our favourites. Yes. Any illuminations there? Because it's that's, that's a tremendous site. A yeah. tremendous site. It's on a plateau. It's on its own little plateau, um, looking out across the Irish Sea. And when you stand on it, you see the beautiful Sorry. cliffs of, of um, Bradhead. I think it is. Is the, yeah. the cliff that you see, um, which has early copper deposits. It has copper deposits in and some early working. Um, fantastic site. Mole Hill itself is a series of six small passage graves arranged in a circle. The mound unfortunately disappeared long ago, but some of the excavations did find things in the in the kists, in the chambers, um, white pebbles, some beautiful pottery. In fact, it gives its name to the uh, pottery style on the island from the early Neolithic. Um, well, it's it's a very interesting site. Um, its analogies and as it were, origins, are probably somewhere further south down the Irish Sea. Um, there is a very similar site in Pembrokeshire, for example, which has a, the same situation. It's on a plateau, a little platform, overlooking the coast, overlooking areas where there's probably metal ores as well. And the arrangement of multiple passage graves is something we don't find much in England and Wales, but of course we do find in Western France. Mm. And in Normandy we get this same sort of collection of passage oh. graves all in a single mound. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's it's... Its origins lie somewhere to the south, mm. probably across the Channel mm. in, uh, in western France, that sort of area. But there is a bit of a story, because when we came to survey um, Mull Hill, we did, we did some geophysics and we mapped everything, and we got home in the evening and processed the data, and of course it came up on the screen, and there's what looks to be a ditch around it. And we thought, wow, ditch around a passage grade, that's something pretty special. So the following day we went and did a bit more on it and had a careful look and we did some resistivity as well and we couldn't see this ditch. We're thinking, what, what's going on here? Why, is, why are we getting a beautiful signal on the gradiometry which suggests that there might be a ditch and, and we can't see it on anything else? And then it penny dropped. There had once been a barbed wire fence <laughs> around the site um, and of course okay. as it rotted as the metal rotted these little fragments of iron oh. fell down into the ground and became right. incorporated into the soil over a distance of I don't know, 60 or 70 centimetres either right. either side of the fence the fence was long gone um, but its signal was still there in right. the ground good and, catch um, good, good catch, catch. Yeah. it just, just goes to show how 
very, very careful, yeah. very cautious one has to be. In fact, I've, we've come to the understanding that you accept nothing on a geophysical survey until you've sampled it. Yes. Until that time, it is simply an anomaly. It's not an anything in archaeological terms, yeah. it being an anomaly. Once you've sampled it, once you've looked at it, then you can say something about it. But <laughs> there's a great danger of um, you know, rushing into print with something <laughs> special. And uh, that one showed, yeah. us, showed us to be a little bit cautious. So if we can uh, bring ourselves back over the other side of the <laughs> Irish Sea, um, I'm fascinated by um, your path to becoming associated with Stonehenge. Stonehenge is the site that everybody likes to think about, and um, Stonehenge is really good to think with. It's a, it's a classic site, of course, and it's a honeypot site. Um, mm. And it's really, really important in focusing our mind, not just on the monument itself, but on all the things that are going on, chronologically speaking, before and after the stones, and spatially speaking, in terms of how that landscape works, not just around Stonehenge, but as part of a pattern of ceremonial centres right across the whole of the British Isles. Yeah. So but what was your but what was your personal journey? To yeah, that, well, it was a really it's a really interesting thing. So many times one gets involved in archaeological sites, just as we we're talking about with the Isle of Man, almost by chance, mm. by things conspiring and, and opportunities appearing, which you can take up. And I first got really involved in Stonehenge. I knew about it, had been there, and all the rest of it, like every student of archaeology does, when. The proposals came out in, I think it was 1983, to really change the visitor arrangements, oh. to create a new management plan for Stonehenge. Yeah. And the first job that English Heritage did when it was created, and I think, I think Lord Montague went to Stonehenge and announced it, was to say, right, we're going to sort out Stonehenge, 1983. Mm -hmm. Keep that date in mind. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they, they were casting round to engage some experts and consultants and people to get involved in what at that time was just the management side of it. And I joined forces with uh, a company, Devon and Tucson and Chinex, who are a big property company, and became their archaeological advisor on a team we put together to bid for this piece of work. Mm. We were successful. Was that bid. under the auspice of Cotswold Archaeology? No, that was, no. That, was, that was purely by Devon and Tucson and Chinex, who, um, who was, as I say, this property company. And um, they had land agents and, and managers and, and myself as the archaeological advisor. And, and we, we got, the, got the contract to be the consultants to start developing this plan. And, of course, the plan which emerged was a fairly straightforward one, was to get rid of the A344, which is the little road that runs alongside Stonehenge, to move the visitor centre from its old location right next to the stones to another place, perhaps a mile or two away, and to encourage the undergrounding of the A303 into a tunnel to get that out of the landscape and to create um, an environment, which had to be done, of course, with the National Trust as well as English Heritage, whereby the landscape of Stonehenge could be opened up and people could walk freely, see all the other monuments, the Barrow Cemeteries, the Cursus, the Avenue, all the things that go with Stonehenge, so that it became more or less an archaeological park was the kind of vision yeah. that we had. Mm. Well... How many years on? <laughs> yes. Quite a few years on, several decades on. Well, the 344 is gone. That, uh, that is absolutely phenomenal. The visitor yeah. centre, of course, has been moved from its, its um, dreadful place just north of Stonehenge. Yeah. The car park's yeah. all been grassed over now. That's out of the way. And it's, it's moved across to Edmunds Cross. And um, that's a beautiful centre. And, and it's true. It's proved it incredibly popular. Yeah. I mean... Conservative estimates thought that the same sort of numbers would go, but actually it's increased considerably. Yeah. And um, it's a beautiful experience now. You can go to the centre and then be either walk up or be taken up in the bus, mm -hmm. go and see the stands and then come back. And, of course, it helps at the solstices. It helps at all the other events too. It's a much more organised landscape. And by taking the visitor centre out of the landscape, it does really make it a beautiful place to walk in now. Yes. Yeah. You can walk across from Fargo Plantation, you can walk down the avenue, for example, you can walk across mm -hmm. the Cursus and so on, and you don't see coaches and cars and yeah. the light reflecting off the vehicles moving around. There's no tarmac there anymore. There's the pathway, of course, but you know, compared yeah. with what was there even if just a few years ago, it's, it's minute now. And taking that road out of the landscape completely changes the ambience of the place. Yeah. It's so quiet now. Yeah. 
and the only disturbance that's left, of course, is the A303. And, well, that's an ongoing debate at the moment. We're, um, we're on tenterhooks as to what the government is going to say about that. Personally, I just hope we get that tunnel going as, as quickly as we can. And yes, we can feelings run very high. Don't feelings they? run high on, on both sides of that. Um, but the evidence of the 344 is that taking that road out of the landscape is going to make mm-hmm. such a big difference yes. and really put Stonehenge back to being a big park that people can enjoy. Yes. And really the important thing from an archaeological perspective is they can experience and understand walking to Stonehenge, mm. seeing all those other monuments, looking around, feeling the barrow cemeteries, using the avenue, walking the cursus, doing all these things which takes them away from Stonehenge but then brings them back to it intellectually and and practically as it were and I think personally that plan that we evolved back in the 80s if it comes to fruition and there's just one more piece of the jigsaw to tap into place as I say um, when that's achieved the amazing Stonehenge landscape is going to be even more amazing. Yes. Uh, do you know what? I think it's, it's, it's fair on that point specifically. Do you just want to say your thoughts on... Because there's so much feeling that uh, so a tunnel would be so destructive to the archaeology. But uh, the point uh, you made when we were talking before about... You know, but the road's already there. The road's been dug. You know, To actually put a tunnel underneath it is, uh, is less destructive than a lot of other aspects could be. That's right. I think people forget that the project is about taking a road out of the landscape, not putting a road in the landscape. Yes. What we will end up with is a road that disappears underground somewhere across to the east on King Barrow Ridge, and it's going to reappear again well to the west of Stonehenge. Um, And in between, we're going to have a grassy set of grassy fields. There'll be some footpaths across it, of course, and people will get a roam about, um, and it'll be absolutely fantastic. The alternative, I'm afraid to say, is that the um, the companies who are involved in this and, and um, Transport England and all the rest of these organisations are going to be putting a four-lane road online through the Stonehenge landscape. That's the alternative. Which is far um, more destructive. Which is far more destructive, yeah. both physically and also in terms of the light pollution, the air pollution, the sound pollution and all the other things that go with it. Now, getting the road undergrounded is is the way, it's the solution. And at the moment fingers crossed, the budget is there to do that. The alternative which people have talked about, and it's, it's totally fair and reasonable, is, is to move the road a long way to the south. But of course we know that as soon as you start moving big roads, you start damaging a lot more archaeology. Yeah. At the moment, the distance is minimal between you know, point A and point B on the existing road. If we had to move the road, let's say, five miles to the south, then the amount of road you'd need to build is hugely greater. I mean, yeah. maybe... 20 or 30 times more road has to be built. Mm. And what we know is that the World Heritage Site is a completely arbitrary line, and immediately outside it, there's just as good archaeology as there is inside it, yeah, perhaps yeah. even better in some areas, um, and no one's going to build a road through that part of Wiltshire without doing some archaeological damage. Mm. Um, the work that's been done by, by a lot of experts over many years to get the portals of the tunnel in the most archaeologically appropriate places, that is where they do the least damage, um, means that I think we can get a great solution and everybody wins. Mm-hmm. It's not a subject that we've brought up on our podcast at all, but it's, I think <laughs> it's really great to, to hear that perspective uh, on, on the whole yeah, thing. It I mean, is, it's important. We could yeah. talk longer on that subject. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if we, we look at what one of the lenses, one of the perspectives that we have on Stonehenge now is, is largely down to yourself and your association with the late Geoffrey Wainwright. Mm-hmm. How, how did you speak a bit about how you came to work with... Uh, well, Jeff was involved, of yeah. course, in the, in the management side of, of um, the Stonehenge project right from the beginning, and I knew Jeff even before that um, through his work as um, head of the Central Excavation Unit and things that we'd done um, with them in the past. So we, we, were, we were good friends at that point already. Mm-hmm. Um, once we got involved in the in the management project, then we realised that there was a lot more common interest as well in thinking about broader things and think, thinking about the archaeology itself as well as how we look after it. And so we soon got to got to think about how we could pursue that a bit. Um, Jeff, of course, was a Pembrokeshire man, born and bred in Pembrokeshire, and Wales was right at the centre of his his thinking. And so when he retired from English heritage, he moved full time down to Pembrokeshire. 
And that provided us with a great opportunity to start um, exploring the Preselis in a bit more detail. And we set up a project called Spaces, which was to have a look at the distribution of monuments around the Preselis. Can I just say something that I, I picked up on? It was only in 1923 that I've forgotten his name, who first pointed out that the blue stones came from the Priscillis. Yes. Yes. And you and Jeff Wainwright were the first archaeologists to go to the Priscillis in all that time since. That's pretty much right. H.H. H. H. Thomas, who was, yeah. who, was the, who was the petrographer for um, the geological survey, was the first person to make that connection, as you, as you rightly say, back in the... He published his paper in 1923. Um, and not many archaeologists went down there to, to really follow it up. Mm. Um, Peter Drewitt did a little bit of survey down there. Um, Peter Grimes did a little bit of survey work down there, but they never really broached the big question, which is where are the quarries, how does it actually work? Yeah. And that's, that's what was at the forefront of our mind. And we spent several years just literally surveying very carefully across the Priscillis and identifying possible quarry sites, not just for the dolerites that go to Stonehenge, but other kinds of stone as well. And subsequently we've excavated a couple of those and got some very appropriate radiocarbon dates and all that worked. But of course, that meant we had to look at the Stonehenge end as well. Mm -hmm. And what was, I think, really nice about the project is that it was almost a kind of seesaw um, research program that started in Priscillis, but then moved to Stonehenge and then moved back to Priscillis and then moved back to Stonehenge. <laughs> so all the time we were looking at the two ends of the, of the route, as it were, of the yeah. process that what was going life. on. What a life. Uh, what a life. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to balance those things up. Um, and then, of course, there, there came a point around about 2007 when we started thinking, well, what we need, of course, is some new data from Stonehenge. What we need is to get back inside Stonehenge and get some properly collected samples, which might help us do some dating, but more importantly, we could quantify the kind of stone which was there and, and again, look at this question of the matrix and how the site actually works. Um, and so there was an opportunity to do that, and um, we went there in 2008 and did a very small excavation. It was only two metres square, but actually, <laughs> it was the first time anyone had excavated inside the centre of the stones. Yes. And um, it's still the only excavation that's, that's been there. It's the only excavation inside the middle of Stonehenge this century. Well, that, that's um, something we really wanted to <laughs> ask you, is when, you, when you're given the opportunity to, uh, to make a hole in the ground in probably the most revered site uh, that Britain possesses. Yeah. You know, what, what was it like for you at the time? Was it, was it, was it absolute trepidation or, or were you completely excited about just getting stuck in? Well, we were completely excited about it um, because it was the, it was the fulfilment of a, an opportunity to, to get some new data and get some new insights into what was going on there. As I said several times before, really, there's a, there's a limit to how much you can press old reports. Mm. They're great, and you can reinterpret them and re-look at them and so on. But somehow you've got to get new information, new insights. And so that was the, that was the driving factor. We realised we could only do a small amount. Um, we chose carefully where we wanted to put our trench. Um, it turned out, of course, to be much more complicated than we thought it was going to be. Um, nobody had known what a surprise. Yeah, nobody had excavated there since 1960. Nobody could quite even remember some, some of the things that went on there. There was nobody alive who really understood what was what was done back then. So we were going almost cold into it in terms of, of experience of working at Stonehenge. Yeah. We couldn't draw on other people's recollections and so on to speak of um, but having said that I mean we had a very competent team both processing the samples on site and, and working in the trench it was um, logistically tricky because of course our, our processing site was way off outside the car park area we were actually inside the stones we couldn't get in and out very easily during the day so stuff had to come in and yeah. in the morning and then out again in the evening and so on well, logistically it was incredible. just to, just to say i mean it, it was sort of skipping over it a little bit lightly because there's a lot more to it than that <laughs> Uh, How even, long have we got? E well, <laughs> e even you know, an archaeologist with a reputation you had at that time, there's several hoops to jump through, high hoops to yes. jump through in order to start, you know, applying your spade to the turf at yeah. Stonehenge. There uh, was a lot of hoops to jump through. Not only that, <laughs> um, but when you get to apply that spade to the turf at Stonehenge, there are several television cameras pointed directly <laughs> at you, which is not yeah. the usual way things happen. 
<laughs> there wasn't. There wasn't. And um, yeah, while well, there was an awful lot of meetings, an awful lot of documents had to be produced, yeah. not least all the health and safety issues and the ethical issues and, and the process of the excavation. Just so and people how know. It all works. Just so the, people the know. The volume yeah. of, I can't remember how many pages the thing runs to, but there are literally hundreds of pages of, of project design and all the development stuff that we needed to get the permissions and so on. But I have to say, everybody was actually enthusiastic about making something happen. Yeah. Um, and we received very positive responses right from the beginning to, to do this. So that was, that was all very encouraging. But of course, the time came, as you rightly say, and uh, the date was set. Uh, it snowed, I think, the day before or the day after. <laughs> it was only very cold at that time. We had to break the ice mm. on our equipment sometimes. But... Um, I can't remember how many how many international press cameras there were, but the first press call I think had thirty or forty crew there, um, all of whom wanted to film us putting our spade into the turf. Although of course the turf was put down there in nineteen eighty two and eighty three, <laughs> so it wasn't awfully old. But um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the first the first few layers were were pretty modern, but nonetheless it was the sort of symbolic breaking of the soil mm, and, yeah. uh, we had to do that a few times so that everybody could get their shot of, of it happening um, after that they followed us carefully and, and the BBC were very closely involved in the whole project we yeah. involved them yeah. right from the start and that was that was hugely important and um, so they they ran live uh, links from the excavation into a tent we set up in the car park so there were big screens and you could I didn't have ever of course go and have a look myself but there, were, there was a, a live feed of, of what we were doing in the trench I mm. can't imagine what that looked like but <laughs> a lot of people seemed to enjoy it which was great <laughs> uh, they made several programs about it of course which was which was absolutely spot on as well um, and importantly we, we involved a lot of other communities in our work as well um, so Frank Summers who's one of the main uh, leaders of the Druid group who, who meet at Stonehenge um, arranged for us to have an opening ceremony and a closing ceremony as part of part yeah. of our work and that was that was hugely important involving as many of that community as many different communities the stakeholders as we could. if you like yeah. they're all part of the yeah. Stonehenge story and mm. um, you know they were interested in what we were doing we we're interested in what and what they're doing and so that that um, set of relationships worked extremely well and, and that opening ceremony is one of the things that still stands out in my mind, even before we put a spade in the ground. Okay, that's interesting. And we'd actually you know, stood there and, and just Amazing thought about it. Amazing memory to have, yeah. It is, and it, it sort of comes back to what I was saying about listening to the site, because it's mm. in that moment of calm, it's in that moment of quietness, when you're there, standing amongst the stones, knowing exactly what you're going to be doing over the next few days in terms of opening the site up. And I suppose at that moment you tune in, if that's the right expression but you tune in to the land to the site to the deposits to the stones yes and to my mind it's all about opening one's experiences opening one's emotional attachment to it but also opening one's senses mm -hmm. to what you're going to do and sometimes you just need to stand and be quiet mm. at these places and just feel how the site is going to unfold we don't know, yeah. but we've mm. got to be prepared, in a sense, to see and feel and experience almost anything yeah. in that little block of ground that we're now going to take apart. Yes. Um, and we ended up taking, of course, huge amounts of samples, so much as we took so many samples, we had to buy some soil to put back in the <laughs> trench to make it up level again <laughs> at the end of the excavation because... Uh, Forget, I think it was something like three and a half cubic meters yeah. of That's sample. That's interesting. Were you we cautious taken? about where you bought it from? Oh yes, it had to be. It had to be um, properly uh, properly sourced, and um, it was it was uh, very nice soil, which which had been treated, so there was no contamination right. in it. There was cool. no yeah, yeah, material yeah. in it. Yeah, uh, that was all agreed with English Heritage where we where we got it from. But we <laughs> had to top up the site and, uh, and That's course, put it all back. Yeah. It's very hard to see where the excavation is now. When you go inside the circle, um, it's actually pretty hard to spot it. Aside from the degree to which um, <laughs> your findings fed back into the theory that you and Jeffrey Wainwright came to the site with, what were the big takeaways about what had been going on at Stonehenge in the interim? Mm. <laughs> well, I suppose one of the big themes of Stonehenge, one of the themes that Jeff and I were very keen on, on developing, was the idea that Stonehenge doesn't have one explanation. Mm. It's one of those sites that, is of course very long lived. It probably changed its purpose, its function, if you like, over the course of the fifteen hundred years or so that its its main phases represent. And why should we assume that even in any of those one periods, 
the thing was used for one purpose. An analogy, it's not a good analogy, but an analogy is a church today where people are married, people are buried, people are christened, there's harvest festivals, there's all sorts of interesting events yeah. happen there, celebrations, commemorations. It's not one thing, it's a whole range of different things. And so our idea is, of course, that Stonehenge is, is multiply used at any one point in time and that the architecture and structure of the site reflects those many different uses and so our job is to start unpicking some of that architecture and I think we've been quite successful in that in just recognizing I think really for the first time although perhaps others would say they spotted something similar that the sarsen structures which our excavations show remain in place once they're built they just stay there those are the architecture of Stonehenge they are the framework if you like of, of how the building works Inside it, we've then got these blue stones from Wales, which just move about the whole time. And they're always being smashed up, replaced, moved. They, to us, are the power of Stonehenge. Whatever Stonehenge is about, it's the blue stones, which are the power behind it. They are the power of place, if you like, at Stonehenge. And one of the things we wanted to do was get a really good sample of the so-called Stonehenge layer, which is this deposit of broken up bluestone, which every other excavator has always reported, and we found it too, running across the site. It's it's about 10 centimetres thick, and it's basically just broken bits of bluestone. Right. And what it shows, of course, is that the bluestone monument was continually broken up and used for things. Now, the reason we wanted that sample is so we could see what it comprised. Previously, they kept bits, but we didn't have complete sets. And what we found is that they were working those blue stones. They were smashing them up. They were making things out of them. We even found a little rough out of an axe, for example. They were making, making discs, which things which we interpret as amulets, talismans, these kind of things, lucky charms, if yeah. you like. Yeah. And that is what sort of evidence we were looking for in relation to our, our bigger notion which was that the purpose of Stonehenge included wasn't necessarily exclusively but included a healing role just as for example you know Santiago de Compostela or yeah, yeah. Lourdes or Mecca or any of these other great ceremonial religious sites have at their heart looking after the well-being of people the spiritual well-being, yeah. the physical well-being, all these things, of course, in prehistoric contexts are wrapped up together. You can't separate it out mm. in the way perhaps we do today. So that idea of healing and well-being is something which was central to our idea. And but but really that, we found idea the of, that idea of, of healing and well-being is not an, a whimsical idea plucked out of the ether. There are several elements, that go, several pillars that support that term. Uh, that that idea that's absolutely yeah. right and and we we developed those and thinking about those before we before we started our excavation and part of the reason for the excavation was to get the bluestone data to start analyzing that in a bit more detail so the foundations of that argument actually come originally from good old Geoffrey of Monmouth who who basically tells us that now the nice thing about Geoffrey is that it's the first time that anyone wrote about Stonehenge the first, or it's the earliest, I should say, account that we've got preserved of Stonehenge. Um, dates to the 12th century, 1130s, that sort of period. It's the only archaeological site in Britain that he comments on in any detail, and the detail we've got is very considerable. So there is a debate, and there has been since Stuart Piggott wrote about it in antiquity many, many years ago, as to whether we should accept elements of Geoffrey's text as oral tradition, mm -hmm. which he'd embedded, as it were, in the fantasies that he created um, of the history of the kings of Britain all around it. Piggott liked the idea, we're, we're happy to accept as well, that the sources available to Geoffrey of Monmouth included oral traditions, and some of those could be quite ancient. When we look at his stuff on Stonehenge, he's, he's very clear that, and he says it several times in the way the narrative unfolds, that the reason those stones were moved is because of their healing properties and he wraps it up in the idea of magical properties and magical powers that Merlin is involved with. Of course, that's the nature of the narrative that, that they were creating. Isn't there a specific mention of, uh, of, of di uh, hollows and water? They, they describe um, exactly how it should be used, and um, the way it works is that you create pools and that the water in the pools is what actually, if you like, um, uh, achieves, affects the healing process. And uh, the blue stones or at least the stones, because of course he doesn't differentiate the different kinds of stones, and the stones are involved in that process. Well, 
the blue stones are what we must be talking about. And in more recent folklore, we find it's the blue stones which are considered by people to be the healing stones. And there are pictures from the 17th century onwards of, of people chipping bits off and so on. And we can see that on the stones today. We can still see the scars as yeah. it were, from where people have done that in modern times. And we've got the evidence from prehistoric times of the flakes and the yes, remains. Yeah. So this is a tradition that certainly goes right back. The weird thing, perhaps, is, and, and the important element for connecting up the theory, is that those same traditions also apply on the Priscillites. So holy wells, sacred springs, are very, very much a part of the Priscilli landscape. Many of them are still in use today, and if you, if you go to them, you find that they've been used in the last few days or weeks or months. There's remains yeah. there of people's deposits and so on, and sometimes they scratch their name on stones and things. So we can see that happening. And again, just in the place name evidence and in the way the Christian church has appropriated the holy wells, they are of great antiquity. And one or two, we find rock art around them, and we find up on the Priscilla's themselves, um, that they've created pools, we call them enhanced spring heads, where they've taken a spring air and they've built a little wall to create a pool. Mm. And one or two of those have got rock art in them as well. Yes. So we can be fairly confident, I think, that these interests in those sacred springs and in the water and in the rock go back a really, really long way. And it's important that both in the source of the stones and in the place where they ended up at Stonehenge, we've got the same traditions yeah. being reflected and represented. And that, I think that's what gives it power, and that's perhaps what underlines and really uh, strengthens the argument that we should take Geoffrey of Monmouth's considerations very seriously. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's interesting. How, how broad do you think was the notion of... Uh, of chipping away bits to take as amulets because I was it, it uh, brought to mind uh, the Kingstone and the Royal Rite Stones mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. where you actually have the illustrations over the centuries that show you how yeah. the shape of the stone has changed, changed from where people were chipping bits away. Yeah, I think a lot of sites have got this process going on, and really we have to recognise that throughout prehistory, of course, concerns about health and well-being were absolutely central to people's lives. I mean, yeah, it, it is. It must be one of the most fundamental emotions that a human being can experience. Yes. You want to be as well as you possibly can be, and, and just as importantly, you want your loved ones to be well as well. Mm. So, you know, this is this is right at the heart of human existence. Especially and if you're experiencing pain yes. and uh, are, are seeking some kind of escape from yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, so, of course, they're going to build monuments, they're going to build places to facilitate well-being or to obviate pain and these kind of things everybody does that that's a part of what every major religion is involved with it's about making people healthy physically and spiritually and the two usually go together of course um this is at the heart of it archaeologists have danced around the idea of ritual and ceremony for so long and haven't jumped into the middle and when you jump into the middle as we've done what you find is that middle ground is all about human emotion Mm. and human Mm. well-being yeah. Wow. Yeah. The gods help, of course. They're part of the story. Yes. The physical landscape helps. That's part of the story. But at the end of it, it's about people being at these monuments, being at these places, creating them in a way that makes them feel better. Yeah. At the end of the day, yeah. and that's that's really what so many sites are about. And, and we've just got to loosen up a bit on this yeah. idea of ritual and say, okay, ritual, that's good. But what exactly do we mean? It's not just about carrying a few corpses and putting them in the ground. It's yeah. actually about building stones. It's that yeah. powerful yeah. human emotion about well-being that has so much power that it brings the whole of Neolithic society together in order to create this extraordinary place on the Wilt- on the Salisbury Plains. Yeah. You know, in, with a... Com- yeah, I mean, it, it, you begin to understand how people had the the motivation to transport those stones over all that yeah. distance by there's whatever no, means. There's nothing yeah. more fundamental than mm. people's well-being. Yeah. At the end of the day, that's what can drive people to... Extraordinary feats. Absolutely feeds. extraordinary mm. lengths, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. And, you know, when you look at the bigger picture, Stonehenge is, is one of a, at least two or three dozen ceremonial sites across the British Isles, but it stands out as the biggest and the yeah. most important in the way that you can pick out the Meccas and the Santiago's yeah, yeah. and yeah. the Romes and the Jerusalems yeah. and so on as you know the big places in medieval times. There's only a few of them yes. at the top of the tree, as it were, at the top of the hierarchy, um, and they're known to everybody. 
and the really difficult cases, if you like, go to those big places. Yeah. Everyone's got a local access and they've got their local church, if we follow the medieval analogy. Um, so they did in the Neolithic. They had their own local shrines and their local places to go and no doubt local people who could look after them. But occasionally you've got to go to the big place, the big centre. And that's now, been hinge. We we could, you know, obviously do a ten part series. I was uh, going to say, yes, we could Stonehenge talk for many hours. Itself, but I know that you also want to speak about archaeology general and the way forward for archaeology. But before we leave Stonehenge, is there anything you need to say about that to underline that that would actually be interesting to people that came away from your two thousand and eight dig or any other details? Well. That I mean, we're, st- we're still processing some of that dirt, actually. Wow. But, uh, yeah. I had some boxes of it out on my, in my room this, just this last week looking yeah. at the stuff. Um, we're getting on nicely with it. And, of course, every box you open seems to open up new stories and new insights into what's going on. There's, there's still so much to find out about Stonehenge. We've only scratched the surface. Before too long, I don't know what I mean by before too long, but in the next decade or so, there needs to be some more excavations there to follow up other ideas and develop other ideas. We've got to keep this ball rolling got to keep it moving and um, the work that Mike Parker Pearson and some of the other teams that are working at Stonehenge means that we've got this this kind of critical mass of lots of ideas bombarding into each other Mm. Um, I don't think they're all mutually exclusive we shouldn't set them up against one another they're often actually complementary ideas and all of us are working on the on the same idea which is that we want to unfold the Stonehenge story yeah. in a new, in a meaningful and, and perhaps much more nuanced, much more understandable way. And everything about Stonehenge, I think, has changed in the last 20 years or so. Um, those old books about it got a lot to commend them, but I'm afraid there's a lot more detail that we now know, a lot more interest in the sites. And it's only just the beginning. Yeah. Exciting. It's only just the beginning. Exciting stuff. Yeah. 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 So, to the present day, well, yes, in, in, yes. A, in a manner of speaking. Well, we know that you have uh, um, other big projects of uh, where you're taking archaeology <laughs> now. There's, well, there's always lots of projects. There's too much to do in a, in a single lifetime, of course. But, you know, archaeology in the last 20 or 30 years has, has been an incredible experience. And it's incredible, personally, to have been part of it, part of a big team of people who are working on it. I mean, what's been achieved is absolutely phenomenal. When you stand here in 2020 and just look back, see the amount of work that's been generated through the commercial world of archaeology, for example, 4,000 excavations a year. They've changed the story of every period of the prehistoric and the Roman and medieval and, and even more recent past as well. They've changed our basic understanding of those things. When you look at the success, for example, of the Portable Antiquities Scheme, they've got a million and a half fines registered on the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Good grief. That is extraordinary. When you look at the changes in legislation in relation to treasure, for example, something which people often think of, archaeology and treasure kind of go together mm. hand in hand. The amount of treasure cases now, and more importantly, the stuff that's coming through, the contexts that are coming through with it, and the opportunities which are now being really exploited to the full to get out and excavate sites where these things are found. Yes. Again, it's just changed our understanding of things. When you plot out, you can go online. There's fantastic resources online these days. You can plot out Iron Age coins or Roman brooches or whatever it is you want to, to have a look at, and you get these new patterns. And we suddenly realised just how regional the country was at different times, how different areas were doing different things with different sorts of material. We're seeing a past which is not just more complicated, but incredibly more interesting and really, really detailed perspectives, where 50 years ago we had a dozen finds, we've now got 100, and we can start mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. to start to see yeah, the patterns yeah. coming through. So, you know, we've had a fantastic period, and, and archaeology has done incredibly well on all of this. But the question now before us is, is where do we go next? You know, we could just carry on doing more of the same, and that is worth doing and probably would be interesting. But standing still isn't always an option. We need to kind of keep moving. So we've got to think about how we can use this. And I think there's quite a big expectation across a lot of publics, across a lot of communities, that we can use this material, perhaps in new ways, in different ways. And I've been quite heartened recently having a look at... Um, a set of policies which was developed by the United Nations. And these policies are to create, as it were, agendas for national governments to get involved with what they refer to as sustainable development goals. 
And there's a whole series of these goals, which they want to see well on the way, if not fully achieved, by 2030. So we've got a decade or so to think about them. And many of those goals actually are directly relevant to archaeology. We've been talking about well-being. Well, goal three is all about well-being. So how can we use archaeological monuments to advance what is an internationally agreed agenda to promote and enhance the well-being of, of ourselves, of our current generations, of our people and our children and so on? Um, how can we do that? So one of the areas we've been working on is, is to see how we can use, for example, the Stonehenge landscape, the Avebury landscape, in the context of well-being. We've been working on it with a project called the Human Henge, which kind of nicely introduces the, the idea that it's about people and about us, as it were, yeah. um, to see how we can use that in, in connection with helping people with long-term mental illness. How can they use the heritage, use the landscapes, use the sites to enhance their place in the world, enhance their well-being. Yeah. And we've done some experimental work on this and, and we can see ways of doing that. We can develop programs, therapy programs, if you like, which from the pilot studies we've done look to be quite successful. I hope we'll be able to develop these on a bit. Well, that's one of those 17 goals. Yeah. Okay. Right. There's lots of others. Some of them involve, absolutely involve things about knowledge, about the creation of understandings of our world. Well, archaeologists have been doing that for the last three or four hundred years. Yeah. You know, we can contribute to this. Yeah. We've got plenty to contribute to this. Um, others are about looking after the oceans, for example. Well, again, marine archaeology is a big field these days. Yes. We can actually <laughs> help with this. We can yeah. say something about this. We can contribute to these things. And when you read through these different goals, you realize that actually we've got an immense amount to contribute pretty much to all of them. Maybe when it comes back, when it yeah. comes back to the knowledge aspect of archaeology, though, don't, do you think there's, there needs to be a philosophical change within archaeology itself to its approach to knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge and the way that you, you approach the knowledge in the first place, yeah, in order well, to yeah. achieve you know, absolutely, some kind of absolutely. And, and I have um, written one or two things starting to think about this, and it works in two directions. I mean, the simple side of it is, of course, that. The way we approach the past, if you like, the archaeological theory that goes with it, is always changing. It's always developing. So in the 1960s, we had the new archaeologies of, of uh, David Clark and others. Um, as we come into the 1980s, you know, we have the post-processional archaeologies of Ian Hodder and others, and, and they took us in a wholly different direction. Very relativist kind of perspectives and philosophies were applied there. We've kind of run out of steam a little bit, perhaps in some of those areas now, and we're beginning to think about where we go next. And one of the areas that's that's becoming very attractive is is looking at, if you like, the place of people in relation to the bigger world, in relation to the bigger environment, and areas of, of so-called native science in other other communities, other parts of the world, um, have a bearing on on some of this. Um, so-called cosmological perspectivism is is one line of thinking which takes us exactly into an area which is coincident with a lot of people's thinking about the world today. And it quite simply is saying that people are part of the environment, not that we control the environment, that we're actually part of it. And in a sense, we've got to learn to work with and speak with and understand the plants, the rocks, the trees, the fish, the animals, all the other things in the world that we find around us, mm. including the bugs that you Absolutely. photographed and stuff. <laughs> you know, every part of the world, every part of the environment is actually part of us and we're part of it. Mm. And so it's about a changing relationship between the human species, if you like, and the environment in which we occupy and the ability to tune into and listen to and understand and, and have agency with, but allow rocks and trees and so on to have agency on us as well. So these are, these are sort of areas that are being explored a little bit more in, in a theoretical way, and, and I think they've got some really exciting possibilities in that way of thinking Do you think that'll help us. But there's, there's another side, sorry to interrupt you, there's, there's the other stream, as it were, is a recognition that there are lots of different kinds of knowledge we've tended to assume that archaeologists produce stories about the past, which we do, um, and do quite well, actually. But there's a lot of people working in archaeology who are producing what, what I would refer to as strategic knowledge. It's knowledge we use in planning systems. It's knowledge we use in environmental assessment. It's the kind of knowledge we use in the world to make decisions, 
by mm. politicians, by government agencies and all these things. And we've got to feed into that process. It's a very different kind of knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's a very different kind of understanding about the world. Mm -hmm. And you might say it starts from different positions in the sense we're thinking about how we go forward. Should we build that road? Should we build that hospital? What should we protect? What should we preserve? What should we excavate? These are very different questions from what happened in the Neolithic. Yeah. But we could accept, if, if we accept those two knowledges, maybe there's others, so we can accept perhaps knowledges that relate to indigenous communities, to those who, who have different understandings of the world, mm -hmm. kind of, um, I suppose you, you would call it sort of esoteric knowledge, mm -hmm. you might call it that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, and they're just as legitimate as well. Why can't we develop and contribute to some of those kind of knowledges? And we, and we can build out this honeycomb if you like, of different kinds of knowledge that we can contribute to. So the idea that we just build narratives of the past i think is something we we accept is part of the job but it is only part of the job there's yeah. a lot of other things and a lot of other archaeologists are working and employed in developing different kinds of knowledge mm. they're all important they're all hugely important in terms of taking archaeology forward and giving us a proper role in the future so it's not too grandiose a statement to suggest that uh, our ancestors have really something to give to us, if we listen hard enough as to how we live our lives, how we deal with our environment, and and how we treat each other as as well, it's not too grand. I don't a thing think that's to, too grand or, okay. or too bold a statement. No. I think uh, the past we can use to make the present and the future better places to be living in. Um, and in a way, if we're not doing that, we're probably not being fully paid up archaeologists. What better way could there be to, to wrap up our conversation, Tim? Mm. Thank you so much for being our My guest. Pleasure. I'm sure. My no, it's been absolutely fascinating, and it's it's lovely to get such rich perspectives from someone who has your depth of experience over the years. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's you. been great. Yeah. Thank you very much yeah. indeed. Most yeah. enjoyable. Hope you enjoyed that, listeners. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. Bye. Hello, Michael Bott here. Thank you for watching this Prehistory Guys show. There's loads more to watch, and you can get to some of it on this playlist here. If you'd like to receive updates about when we publish new content, hit the subscribe button, and you can unlock even more content by becoming a Patreon supporter. Hit this button here to find out more about that. See you soon.